اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم والحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء واعز المرسلین حبیب الہ العالمین العبد المؤید والنور المسدد المصطفى الامجد اب القاسم محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد فيقول الحق وقوله الصدق في محكم التنزيل بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين هم لأماناتهم وعهدهم راعون صدق الله العلي العظيم آمنا بالله ورسوله To hasten the reappearance of our awaited Imam عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف I request we recite three salawat with the loudest of our voices Respected brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. The verse that I started with is verse number 8 from Surah Al-Mu'minun. Surah Al-Mu'minun is considered one of the most valuable surahs in the Holy Quran. In fact, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says in a narration, that I have received a revelation of 10 verses, and whoever applies them shall enter heaven. And understand the weight of such a statement from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's basically telling you that the verses, the 10 verses mentioned in Surah Al-Mu'minun, are verses if one was able to apply the content of such verses, will indeed enter heaven. So confirmation from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that you will be guaranteed heaven. But in, in the condition of what? Under the condition of what? Of applying the content of the verses in Surah Al-Mu'minun. And those verses are none but the first 10 verses in Surah Al-Mu'minun. And if one was to reflect on Surah Al-Mu'minun, one would realize a miraculous reality in it. Is that the wonderful thing about Surah Al-Mu'minun is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins with the reward and then mentions the actions that a mu'min or the characteristics that a mu'min needs to uphold in order for him or her to receive such rewards. The Surah begins by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qad aflah al-Mu'minun. Isn't it? You find that Allah is saying what? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, successful are the believers. Is that right away Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you that you are guaranteed success. So he's providing you with the reward before he even tells you what you're supposed to do. Yet, when we reflect on the characteristics that shall follow in the 10 verses that come after it, we will understand as to why a mu'min is guaranteed success. And I don't think there's any, and there, there isn't a human being in this earth that does not want to guarantee success, be it in this world or the hereafter. And therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah by saying, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qad aflah al-mu'minun. And then he continues by mentioning characteristics of a mu'min. And what is a mu'min supposed to say? In the hadith of the Prophet, what does he say? He says, if one applies the content of the verses that I have received the revelation of, then one is guaranteed Jannah. And focus on the words of the Prophet, is that applying the content of the verses. Because many of us sometimes, yes, uh, and, and there's no doubt that many of us might think that there's only a reward in reciting the Holy Quran. And as I said, there's no doubt that there is a reward in this, of course. But in reality, applying the content of the verses in the, in the Quran are more worthy than even finishing or even reciting a full surah in the Holy Quran. How many of us sometimes when we approach the nights of A'mal, mainly in the month of Ramadan, are reflecting on the words that we recite. When the religion of Islam acquires from us to, is to always um, uh, basically reflect the teachings and the theological perspective perspective and put it into a practical form, no doubt. Isn't it? You find that many of us when we approach the nights of A'mal, we are just concerned about finishing the A'mal. Isn't that true? Is that all what we want to do is that no, we have to go from that A'mal to another, from this page to another. And then we have to recite this ziyara, and then after it this surah and so forth. But in reality you find that the most important factor in these A'mal is applying the content of the A'mal and understanding what are they and why 
why do we do them? Let me give you an example. You find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards the a'mal upon what? Upon sincerity, no doubt. Sincerity meaning what? Meaning the more your heart is sincere in performing a'mal, the greater the reward is. Not the quantity of the amal itself. Let me give you an example. Many of us in every single center and in every single house, a Shia home, you will find that the main book of dua that is present is what? Is the book of Mafatihul Jinan, no doubt, isn't it? You find that there are many other books of dua, by the way. Yet, why is it that it's always Mafatihul Jinan that is present in every, am in every house, let alone in every center? That is the main book that everyone refers to. If you were to reflect on the story of Sheikh Abbas al Qummi, May Allah bless his soul, you will know why. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him with this. That after his death, his book became the main book to refer to in terms of a'mal. When Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi finished the book of Mafatih al-Jinan, what he did is that he did not publish it. He sat down and he studied and understood and performed every single amal in Mafatih al-Jinan. Could you imagine that? There are a'mal in Mafatih al-Jinan that if you really want to do them, you cannot do anything in your daytime. Isn't that true? Is that you won't be able to perform anything in your daytime. Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi, rahmatullahi alayhi, what he did is that it took him a year, a full year where he sat home and he applied every amal in Mafatih al-Jinan and understood it and comprehended it. Then after that, he took that book and then he went to his family. He went to his wife, he went to his children and their families. And what did he do? He sat them down and he told them, I have just finished publishing a book and I applied every single amal in this book. And what what I would like from you is to also join me on the same tawab. I want you to apply every amal in this book and note that I comprehended the concept of every amal in this book. And therefore, the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his sincerity and for his applicable perspective is what? Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his book the main book of amal. So the main notion of the amal is what? Is the sincerity and the main notion of understanding any theological perspective in the religion of Islam is to try transform it into a practical form and therefore you find in the holy quran from the beginning to an end there isn't a time that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Illa amanu, those who believe except that he accompanied it with what wa amilu wa amilu and amal what amilu salihat is that they performed good deeds because that power of iman is supposed to reflect into what into amal it has to be exposed in amal and therefore you find that when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the eighth character or the seventh characteristics in the Quran in Surah Al Mu'minun about defining a Mu'min. He said, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Walladina hum li amanatihim wa ahdihim ra'un. And those who keep their trusts and their covenants. Imagine that that is considered a characteristic of a Mu'min. The concept of trust, by the way, is repeated in the Holy Quran in numerous verses. When you reflect on the Holy Quran, you would find that, yes, though, such verses or the concept of trust is, repeating, uh, is repeated in a different context every time. Yet, if you were to carefully reflect on the Holy Quran, you would notice that trust, that every time it's mentioned in a verse, that all those verses, they revolve around the same meaning in terms of defining trust. And that's why the religion of Islam considers trust as a very essential quality for a mu'min to attain, let alone be defined with it. You find that one of the titles of the Prophet ﷺ is what? As-sadiqul ameen. The truth, truthful and what? And the trustworthy. That even the disbelievers of Quraysh, while they're fighting him on the battlefield, they would entrust him with their trust. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what here? وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِأَمَانَاتِهِمْ وَعَهَدِهِمْ رَعُونَ And those who keep up their trust and what? And their covenants. Moving on, you find that the concept of being entrusted with a trust is something that even Arabs in the times of Jahiliyyah would take honor in. And therefore you would find, for example, that Bani Hashim, Rudwanullahi ta'ala alayhim, from the forefathers of the Prophet وسلم, were always considered the most truthful and most trustworthy. A beautiful hadith comes to mind in this regard, where the Prophet وسلم, says in a hadith, do not be impressed with someone's dua and someone's or the abundance of their salat or even their hajj or their a'mal, but instead, 
look into how truthful they are in their words and how they are willing to fulfill their trusts. Understand that sometimes the practical form of deen is the one that would identify a mu'min, no doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, when he describes a mu'min with that, that means that as a mu'min, and not a Muslim only, that as a mu'min, a believer in the Holy Quran and a believer in the Islamic perspective needs to understand the concept of the trust and a covenant and therefore many of us might think that trust is only of one category yet trust is different categories from which are what for example is the materialistic type of trust the materialistic trust is that sometimes when you are entrusted with something materialistic something physical what you're supposed to do as a mu'min is to keep this trust and if it shall be returned to its people then you return it properly to its people and not only this not only in terms of materialistic but even in structure for example if you are a tenant in a rental property you are being entrusted in what with that property no doubt our community centers they are considered a trust in our hands and by the way on a side note many of us might think that it is a trust or a responsibility by only the committee that gets elected isn't it but in reality no that even the attendees have a responsibility upon the community center in many cases the attendees have also even a higher responsibility on the uh, over the community center to be trusted with this community center keep it Right? Understand that everything that you're being provided here is considered a trust and therefore understand how to use it properly. SubhanAllah. Remember last night we were sitting down, we had dinner and we had a sit down with the many of the brothers, mashallah. And we had a great conversation and our conversation revolved around how to always put the Islamic perspective into a practical form. And the importance of understanding the practical form of Islam, much less the practical form of the uprising of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Because the reality is sometimes, the unfortunate reality in fact, is that sometimes we have bracketed the events of Karbala to a time only. Yes? When in reality you will find that the Battle of Karbala is the battle of good and evil that existed since the existence of humanity and shall continue up until the existence of our Imam Zaman Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. And when we bracketed the events of Karbala in a, t- in a time or in a time and place only, then that resulted in not having clarity to identify the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt in every time and place. Because in our mind, that Yazid and that Shimr is the one that existed 1400 years ago. When in reality, there is a Yazid and a Shimr that exist in every time and a place. And there's a person that represents the uprising of Imam Hussein alayhi salam that stands up to such tyranny and that's what we refer to sometimes in some cases what as a husseini or the hussein of our time because some people get offended subhanallah they get overly sensitive when you say the hussein of the time we're not meaning that the imam himself of course the imam masoom that is not to be compared with anyone indeed but when we say the hussein of our time in the arabic eloquence it means the ones that are willing to rep present the path of Imam Hussein alayhi salam and the ones that are willing to offer the same sacrifices that were offered on the land of Karbala and indeed they exist in fact they have to exist or else how would Imam Zaman Ajallah ta'ala Faraz Sharif have supporters if you were to study and read about the characteristics of the 313 generals that will be in with Imam Zaman Ajallah ta'ala Faraz Sharif then you will understand that they attain characteristics that are no less than the characteristics of what the companions of Imam Hussein salawat Allah wa salam alayhi, much less the devout companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So it is incumbent upon us to put the uprising of Karbala in none but a practical form. It has to be. Why? In many cases you find sometimes the way we picture the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt, we picture them as cartoon villains. And I mean exactly what I'm saying by the way. We picture them as cartoon villains. Why? And that results in let, letting us step out of reality. When you picture the enemies of the Ahl Bayt as cartoon villains, then you will not be able to identify the enemies of the Ahl Bayt in the time that we live in. And in many cases, you might find yourself joining the enemies of the Ahl Bayt without even realizing, isn't it? And that's why you will find that one of the shocks in the times of the reappearance of our awaited Imam Ajallah Ta'ala Faraz Sharif is that many of us will find that the path of Imam Zaman Ajallah Ta'ala Faraz Sharif is not the path of the lifestyle that we have acquired. The interests that we have in this life might not be the same interests of 
Imam Zaman and that's why I always repeat this one of the most dangerous times and the dangerous incidents that would occur during the times of the reappearance of our Imam Sharif is referred to as what? Yawmul Abdal. You know what Yawmul Abdal is? It is literally referred to, translates to the day of exchange. When Imam Al Zaman would meet his nemesis of Sufyani. And by the way, Imam Al Zaman will sign a truce with the Sufyani. Many Shias will be angry at the Imam. They shall say, What do you mean? That that's Sufyani. We expect you to just. Cut his head off on the spot. Because well, and that does exist. Or else we'll reflect back on the life of Imam Rida alayhi salam. And the life of Imam Rida alayhi salam, when he accepted the, and when he forcefully accepted the succession from al Ma'moon, what happened is what? Is that many Shias, they began, they, they, they stopped believing in the asma of the Imam himself. Say that, how dare you accept it? Well, he's an infallible Imam. Is that one of the conditions of being a Shia is to understand the infallibility of your Imam. And if you don't, then you will be misguided. You're not going to understand that. Your imam, your, uh, your imam acts upon his infallibility indeed. On the other hand, you will find that that day of the exchange, what will happen is that as soon as he would confront his nemesis as Sufyani, Imam Al Zaman will announce basically his path. He will announce his program is that this is how I will rule. And as Sufyani will do the same in return. There will people who would be in the army of Imam Al Zaman that would leave the army of Imam Al-Zaman and join as Sufyani. And there will people who there will be people. And that's basically, according to some narrations, after seven years of the rulership of Imam in Kufa, establishing the government of Kufa, that's when he finally confronts the Sufyani. Seven years with the Imam, yet you're willing to leave it. And then why? Because you listen to the uh, program, the curriculum of the Sufyani. That matches your lifestyle more. That matches my lifestyle more. So guess what? would leave the army of Imam Zaman and join the Sufyani. On the contrary, you will find people also leaving the army of Sufyani and joining Imam Zaman, because they found guidance. And if anything we learned from Karbala is exactly this. There was a man named Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riya'i who left the camp of Batil and joined the camp of Haq. The last minute, subhanAllah, one of the scholars says it beautifully. Al-Hur ibn Yazid al-Riyahi, briefly, if you were to summarize his stance, is what? He transformed from Allahumma al-an qatalat al-Husayn wa awlad al-Husayn in the ziyara. Oh Allah, curse the killers of Imam Hussein to what? As-salamu ala al-Husayn wa ala ashab al Hussein. In one stance that he took, he transformed from that to what? To being one who you recite salam to. And you do tawassul with and come, maybe even come, uh, sorry, come nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his love. And that's one stance that al hurab ibn Yazid al did. So be, that, that's why sometimes we focus a lot on understanding the practical form of Karbala. When I go back to what I just said, is that the responsibility that sometimes the attendees have themselves have on the center is understanding the content of the Masa'ib that we recite. And that's what I said last night when we were sat, sat down. Inshallah, it was such a fruitful sit down indeed. When we said what? I said, look, if, let's focus on many of the Masai'ib that we recite and we cry and we mourn and we weep over. But then reflect a bit on the content of those Masai'ib. And then on the night of Ali al-Akbar, we all recite the Masai'ib that when Ali al-Akbar did his first hamla, he came back with the head of Bakr ibn Ghanim. And then he asked his father for what? For a sip of water. Reflect on this a little. A sip of water. You see, a sip of water is literally what you leave sometimes when you drink a cup of water or a bottle of water, and you leave a bit of it, just a sip. See? So in many cases, that might not even quench, in, uh, quench someone's thirst indeed, no doubt. Ali al-Akbar, he asked his father for a sip of water. I want you to reflect on this. And even in the majlis of Ali al-Akbar, sometimes we are present in the majlis of Ali al-Akbar, crying over the masaib of Ali al-Akbar, yet when we leave the majlis, you look around in the hall, be it inside, on the sister's side or even outside in the parking lot. How many half-empty bottles of water do you find? Yeah. How many empty bottles, half-empty bottles of water do you find? No, let's, let's move it further. In our cars, how many of us do we have bottles of water that we don't finish? In our homes, how much water do we waste? Yeah. But then we sit down and we say, oh, he asked his father for a sip of water. When in reality, we're wasting many sips of water. 
And then we sit down and we cry over Ali Akbar. Did we really understand the practical form of Karbala? Something as simple as this. Something as simple as this. Understanding the practical form of Karbala indeed. How many times do we waste? Forget even, not only in water and even in food. Yeah? How many of us are willing to tell our children? And by the way, the solution is not, oh, you know what, let's just water the plants with them. No. No, that's not educating. That's finding a solution. No. Educating is literally what I said. If I'm not mistaken, I was at your service here in Shabaniya when I said that Imam al-Sadiq, sallallahu wa sallam, Imam al-Sadiq, sallallahu wa sallam, says in a beautiful narration, Majalisuna madarisuna. Our majlis is our madrasa. So the member is supposed to, is supposed to educate, not only fuel the emotions and make you cry. That's not the aim. That's absolutely not the aim. It's for the purpose of educating. So the solution is no. Not to, you know what, let's just, no. I'll tell you what the solution is. The solution is that when you set your children down, is that every child that opens a bottle of, bottle of water, you force them to take, the, take it back home with them. And that's the water that they're going to be drinking. The solution is not to give your child everything they want. By the way, and, and, and something that relates to this, you know the scholars of psychology, they say, if you want your child to hate you and hate you, hatred, give them everything they want. Buy them everything they want. Let them have anything they want. Now, that's a, that, these are proven studies, by the way. Why? They say in a child's psyche, they do not understand the concept of your just basically treating them as a child. Oh, it's okay. You can have it, but just don't cry. No. In their psyche, they're understanding that I always get what I want. When they always get what they want, if you were to one day deprive them from something that they want, they will hate you. They will have this hatred towards you. So the scholars of psychology say what? Is that if you want your child to hate you, just give them everything they want. Subhanallah. Beautiful hadith by Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. The hadith says what? He says, اِخْشَوْ شِنُوا فَإِنَّ النِّعَمَ لَا تَدُونَ It says, toughen up and roughen up your children, for blessings do not last forever. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam says, no, 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 toughen up and roughen up your children a little. Let them feel the pain that you go through as a father. Let them feel the pain that the parents have, because many of us sometimes we tend to shelter our children. Is that no, we shouldn't say this to them. No, it's not good for them. No, no, it is good for them. They're not supposed to be too provided with anything they want and everything they want. No, roughen them up a little. Let them toughen up a little. Let them understand that the reality is that there is pain out there. Sit them down, speak to them about what's happening around them in the world. Let them feel with the pain of other children. Understand that they have a blessing and they're not supposed to be given everything they want all the time. So when we sit down in the majalis, no, the solution is not, you know what, we just have to find something to do with it. Absolutely not. Is that no, every person opens up a bottle of water and that's just a simple example I'm giving. Is that no, you take it back home with you and that's what you're supposed to finish. That's what you're supposed to drink or else how do we understand the religion of Islam in the practical form. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, hum li amanatihim wa ahdihim ra'un, is that those who keep up their trust and their covenants, I said what? Is that trust is the, uh, separated in different categories. The first one is materialistic and the example that we gave. The second one is the moral type of trust. And what concerns me tonight is indeed what we refer to as amanatul a'rad in Arabic, meaning being trusted with people's honor. Meaning what? Al-ard is that your ard as a person is basically considered a sister, a wife, a mother, or so forth. And therefore, when you are entrusted with such an amana, yes, when you approach the, um, uh, sorry, when you approach marriage, you are basically being entrusted with an amana. That that girl that you marry is none but a trust. And trust from who? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. Second, from who? From her parents indeed. Last night, I opened up a very sensitive topic indeed. But alhamdulillah, I survived. I made it today. So far, yes. And I have been approached. I'm not going to lie to you. Of course, I've been approached. And many people, of course, there's many realtors that approached me. And they said, Mulana, we're going to be selling a lot of homes after your speech last night. And I said, listen, you might be Khoja, but I'm Lebanese. Do you think I'm not going to take a cut? 
<laughs> no, of course not. What, you think we just give things for free? No, no, Habibi. After last night's speech, if any home is being sold in this community, I want a cut. <laughs> Anyways, I'm just kidding. Nevertheless, so you find that it was a sensitive topic in Iran. Of course it is. And there's many sensitive topics that are, being, that are going to be dissected on the Mumbar. And that's the whole point of the Mumbar. Because if we live in a community or in a society or an Islamic nation that says, no, you cannot speak about this because it's sensitive. You cannot open up this topic because that's sensitive. Someone might get angry. We will get to a point that we will end up having our majalis just simply exactly like a church. We will just sing and dance. Because people might get sensitive, might get emotional. But no, that's not the reality. The reality is that this is our deen. And this is how we put the practical form of the Ahlul Bayt. Uh, of the Ahlul Bayt's um, seerah, their sunnah. Is that it has to be translated to a practical form. And I said last night, and I began from the night before with the concept of what? Of Birr al-Walidain. Simply why? So I can understand and I can set a foundation that inshallah I will dissect further tonight. But then I opened up the topic of what? And the, the last night's topic was in-laws from heaven. Is the concept of how the in-laws are supposed to deal with the daughter-in-law in particular, and in some cases the son-in-law. And that amanat al-arad, being entrusted with people's honor, is indeed the Daughter, that daughter-in-law in your own home. And it is that wife that you marry. Understand that, that is, she is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we spoke about different um, perspectives of it. And then we said we could not continue totally. And there's a point, there are a couple of points that we need to clarify tonight and relate them to our topic of being trusted or attaining the characteristic of Trust. We said that Amanat al-Arad is indeed being trusted in terms of marriage. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ar-Rijalu qawamuna ala nisa Men are the protectors and the caregivers, the guardians of women. What does that mean? That means it's a trust under you. So the wajib, the duty of a man <clears throat> is to honor that trust that he was given. On the other hand, if there was a case that that girl had to live with the in-laws, then they also have to understand that she is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and treat her accordingly. Right? That's her wajib and the wajib of the son-in-law indeed. On the other hand, if there was any topic of dispute or if there was troubles or if there was any issues that might arise, the responsibility of the son-in-law and the daughter-in-law is to treat back the in-laws upon what? Bir. And that's why I defined bir a couple of nights ago. So yes, there are some cases that unfortunately, the in-laws, they end up interfering in their children's marriages, marital relationships, resulting in mistreatment in many cases. And this is why I highlighted this concept last night, is that there are many daughters-in-law that are being mistreated. Why? Because in, there's a perspective or an understanding that they have to live with their in-laws. And what we said is that we shall further dissect this topic tonight. And tonight, inshallah, will be on the, upon the following points. Is that number one? Is that what is the Islamic perspective on married couples living with the in-laws, much less the whole family? And two, what are the pillars of a stable marital life and three is that i would like to reflect on the trust that sayyida zainab alayhi salam was entrusted with and had to deliver on the land of karbala and before i proceed i would like you to provide me with a loud salawat <laughs> first of all as i said is that there's different cultural perspective in some cultures some people prefer to live together, or as soon as the son gets married, is that he lives with his own parents. Sometimes it's a choice, and there's, I know there's a lot of details to get into in this. And this, that's why I always say, the most important thing, is so important and vital in this time and age, is that before our children get married, to sit them down and explain to them what marriage is, and explain to them the fiqh perspective of it, explain to them what are their rights, Explain to them what are their responsibilities. This is absolutely important. You, will be, you would be amazed how many people and people and how many couples come to us and who are absolutely oblivious of their rights. 
Many of them think that a cultural practice is just something that they have to do, when in reality, it is not something that they have to, be, to do religiously whatsoever. Amongst those cultural perspectives, for example, is that sometimes the notion of what? Living together. And it could be in different ways. It could be that they have to live together with the parents and sometimes with the extended family members. For example, a girl gets married to a guy. Then she has to move into his parents' home and then his brother lives there. Sometimes he has more than one brother. And then sometimes he even has a sister who is also married and her husband is also living with them all together in the same house. The religion of Islam, believe it or not, his, the opinion of the religion, the fiqh perspective in this regard is makruh. I repeat, makru, strongly not recommended. Strongly not recommended. Unless there is a case, for example, I don't know, something happened, someone lost their house and so forth. And that is something that does not concern me tonight. As I said, there are so many details that if we get into them, we will not finish. We would need a week to dissect this. And I'm not, and, and, and I think this is actually vital. We do need marriage seminars. Understanding the rights, as I said, Marriage is a contract, and every contract has its condition. There's a reason why I began with the story of Nabi, of, uh, Nabi Musa alayhi salam and Shu'aib. Shu'aib, when he married his daughter too, Nabi Musa alayhi salam, what did he tell him? He put conditions on him that you shall serve me for eight years. Nabi Musa alayhi salam in return replied back to Shu'aib and said what? Sorry, Shu'aib also said to Nabi Musa what? That I, inshallah, you will find, I, will not, I do not aim to be hard on you, and inshallah, you will find me from the righteous ones. Nabi Musa replied back to, uh, to Shaib and said what? And he said that I agree to the conditions and wallahu ala ma naqulu wakil. And Allah is a witness on what we say. So understand that this contract, the witness on it is who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be wary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you treat your son-in-law or your daughter-in-law. Understand that Allah is the wakil. Allah is the witness on it. You have absolutely no right to perform any act of injustice on them or abuse them or speak ill of them or mistreat them. Understand that that girl, when she steps into this house, on top of the fact that she might have expect, accepted to live with her husband's family altogether, which is, as I said, strongly not recommended. And I will get to this. Yes, on top of that, she also has to get mistreated. And that will enter fear in her heart. As soon as fear enter a woman's heart, then it is so hard to let it out. Because then she loses what? Trust. And if trust, as I began in my lecture, is not present in a marital relationship, believe it or not, it's a huge damage. And it will not be fixed unless they, both of them together, the husband and the wife, attain their full privacy and work on their relationship all over again. Why? You see, the scholars say that the toughest, the toughest times or the toughest, toughest years of marriage are the first, what, 30 years of marriage. I'm just kidding, of course, not 30 years. That'll be way too long. No, not at all. The toughest years of marriage are the first two years of marriage. And therefore, it is recommended that even if they do decide to live with the in-laws, let's say, that in the beginning, that they have their privacy and they live by themselves because in that stage you're getting to know a person take it into consideration you might think you know a person but you will never totally understand them and know them perfectly unless you share the same pillow with them that's when you'll know a person that's when you'll understand that you know what there's many traits there's many characteristics there's many habits you have to get to know them so that couple that decide to get married, they need their privacy to get used to each other. They have to get used to each other. Imagine if they live in a big home or with the in-laws or with the family. That's why the fiqh perspective says it's strongly not recommended. Why? Is that number one, as I said, the notion of privacy. Do not belittle the notion of privacy. It's absolutely important. It's vital. It's ibadah. Ibadah in the religion of Islam. To have that privacy with your wife. The religion of Islam, the fiqh perspective, goes into so much details of why privacy is so important between a husband and a wife. So it's important to have this privacy. Yes? Are you able to attain it? Someone might come and tell me, Mawlana, mashallah, we live in a huge mansion and each one can have their own chamber. Sure. Okay, noor and ala noor. That's fine. Let's say, for example. But then again, they need to have their own personal life. No one is supposed to interfere in them. There has to be no outside intervention at all, unless 
unless it's with wisdom and justice. And unless they seek help in certain ways. But in reality, all this type of, of help, it should have been done before marriage. But then let's say it happened, then sure, it could be attained, it could be acquired, but as long as the person who is in the middle is being just and being wise. How do you refrain from all this? Or how do you avoid all this? Give them their own privacy. Let them have their own personal life. Do you know how many parents put a condition on their children? No, you're supposed to live with us. This is our culture. Could you imagine this girl has to live with the husband? And then has the in-laws, of course. And then she has to live with the extended family. Then again, and that's why the, the religion of Islam says makro. For what reason also? The fiqh perspective. Unless she wears her hijab, what's she supposed to do? Just wear her hijab all day? All day wearing her hijab. Why? Because there are non mahram in the house. Right? And I don't know, by the way, there are certain cultures that believe that, you know what, no, my husband's brother is not really a non mahram I can take off my hijab in front. No. You can't. And even if she doesn't wear hijab, well, doesn't she need to beautify herself for her husband? Isn't that true? Because one of the main essentials and main pillars of a marital relationship is what? Is actually beautifying yourself for your spouse, be it a male or female. And I've said this before, you find there are certain men, mashallah, when they leave the house, they look like they just walked out of GQ. They look very well, they dress well, they fix themselves up. Inside the house, they look like they just walked out of DQ, Dairy Queen. You know? It's like, buddy, why don't you beautify yourself for your wife? Isn't it? Very fine. So that notion of privacy and the fiqh perspective. Do not belittle the fiqh perspective. Do not belittle the fiqh perspective. You have absolutely no right to force your wife or your daughter-in-law to do anything or be a part of anything that contradicts the fiqh perspective. For example, no. For, you know what? We're going to have this party in our house. And let's say, for example, we're going to play music. And if she refuses, you have no right to force her, by the way. She has absolutely every right to disobey in this regard. Because you're asking to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If she upholds the religi uh, religiosity and fiqh, then be very proud. Be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such women are rare nowadays. Such men even are rare nowadays. Is that she's willing to uphold the fiqh perspective. So that's another thing. So these are the two. So basically the, the Islamic perspective on it is what? Is that it's not strongly not recommended. Try to avoid it as much as you can. If you can. And if you can live in harmony altogether. Nur and ala nur. Sure. But then reflect back. If, if you were to think about it. That's why I give this full introduction about putting the seerah, the seerah, the narratives of the Ahlul Bayt into a practical form. Look at the Ahlul Bayt, sallallahu alayhi wa Is that many of you have been to ziyara, be it in al Madinah al munawwara or be it in Kufa or so forth. Why is it that they did not live all together in one house? Why is it that they did not live together all in one house? You go there and you find this is the house of Imam al-Hassan, this is the house of Imam al Hussein, this is the house of Sayyidah Zainab ibn Abdullah ibn Ja'far, and this is the house of, for example, Al-Abbas sallallahu alayhi wa and that's the reality. Yeah. They could have all lived in the same house, they're all masoom, mashallah. I'm sure they would have the best of the best of the relationships amongst each other. But no. In reality though, if there is sometimes a fact that you have to deal with and you end up living in that house, sure, you're going to have to acquire patience, but you have the right to ask and request for your privacy. Let me make myself crystal clear. Because many women have this question and they ask this question. You have absolutely every right to number one, put the condition in the contract of marriage that you need to live alone with your husband. You have absolutely every right. And by the way, again, I, I said this last night and I repeat again. I'm not talking about if a person or if a son has parents that are old and require caregiving. That's a different story. That's ibadah when you take care of them. And you put them in your own house, that's ibadah. And an utmost level of ibadah indeed. And it will require, acquire patience, of course, no doubt. Right? I'm talking about just a general norm. What happens sometimes is that, first of all, as a girl, you have absolutely every right to put this as a condition. And do not listen to any form of pressure. When someone tells you, no, it's okay, let's look past that. No. If you understand yourself, knowing yourself, that you need your privacy with your future husband, then put this as a condition in the contract. That's one. Two, 
Even if you understood and even if you were aware of that condition later on in life, in your life, then no, you have absolutely every right religiously to ask to move out and have your own place. And it could be as little as a one bedroom, let's say, for example. But as long as you have it, because what did I say last night? I highlighted the concept of a house and a home to a woman. Every woman, her home is her kingdom, isn't it? Every woman wants to feel that this is my house, this is my territory. That's a given, that's in a woman's nature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created her this way, isn't it? And that's why you find, for example, women, they're overly careful when it comes to the house and inside the house, organizing it, keeping it clean, yes? But then you give them a car, and it's an absolute disaster. Yeah, that's true. But with men, <laughs> but with men, it's the vice versa. Our car has to be spotless, has to be clean, yeah? And I don't understand what's women's obsessions with napkins. You give them a car and right away you find napkins in the cup holder, napkins on this side, napkins on that side. I don't know why. So, anyways, but with men, it's the vice versa. You find our cars are absolutely clean, they're spotless. But the house, no, we don't really care about it. Because that's their kingdom. They have Allah give them this right. So do not deprive them from this right. And I've said it before. The reason I'm bringing up these topics is because this generation is a different generation. This is not the generation that was willing to accept things. This is a generation of alternatives and not a generation that is willing to conform with the reality. Why? Because the modern day system is providing them with a million alternatives. So the last thing that you want them to do is to rebel. Because the generation does not rebel from one thing, by the way. No. They include everything in it. Not every cultural practice is wrong. No? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa kept many cultural practices. Yeah? And even if there's a cultural practice that is wrong, that doesn't mean we adopt another culture, right? We go back to what? To deen. But you have to understand that this is a generation of reaction. They are willing to react. So that's the difference, and that's why it's so important in this regard. Having that said, is that there are many factors that do maintain a marital relationship and that are worthy to uphold, in fact, simply because of time and simply because of this topic and how sensitive it is. Don't blame me. No, no, blame yourself that I have to make so many introductions to this topic. I'm just kidding. You know, but understand that there are very important factors that need, need to be maintained in order for one to maintain a very stable marital relationship. Briefly speaking, I would say that the first one is understanding each other's uh, language of love. Each other's language of love, meaning what? From their own perspective. What they like in order for them to be loved, not what you like. Because there's that notion of the selfish love. Meaning if I, this is the way I conform to things, and this is the way I like things, then I naturally think that the recipient or the opposite party or my partner or my spouse, they should like the same exact thing. No, not at all. You have to understand their language of love. Yeah? When you understand their language of love or your wife's language of love, have fun, of course, if you're going to understand it, maybe after 100 years, 200 years. Nevertheless, I'm just kidding, of course. But anyways, when you understand their language of love, then you'll be able to show them that proper sense of love. Because there is that sense of selfish love. Right? And there's the sense of sincere, true love. And that's what you're supposed to have with them. So that's the first one. And the second one is that, and by the way, the first one acquires sacrifice. You know, subhanAllah, the scholars of Islam, they say that one of the benefits of marriage is what? Is that it teaches you how to become a selfless person. It really teaches you how to become a selfless person. It teaches you the notion of sacrifice. Because there are many things that you're going to have to sacrifice. Right? So this is one of the benefits of marriage. As human beings, we're naturally selfish. So basically, marriage teaches you how to become a selfless person. And that's why a person that acquires selfishness and not willing to let go of it, they suffer in marriage. They suffer a lot in a relationship, even in a friendship. Because everything has to revolve around them. Right? So that's the first one. The second one is that, that facing the issues of marriage with one another. And not only but one another. 
Understand that the biggest mistake you do is to always involve other people in your own issues. Now, do not belittle, as I said before, do not belittle the power of envy. Wallah. Many people that are listening to you, and they're fueling the fire, telling you, do this, do that, leave him, divorce him, leave her, divorce her, so forth, right? There are many people that are willing to take your spot on the spot uh, right away. Yeah? Many people wish for what you have. So be very careful. Your issues are supposed to stay between both of you. And how noble is it, it is of a man or a woman who keep the secrets of their spouse. It's absolutely noble. Yeah? And then, what else? If I were to be asked, in my opinion, if you were to ask me, if I were to be asked, what of the most important factor to maintain a stable marital relationship is basically none but communication. You see, many of us think that since I've been with this person for a very long time, or since I already know this person, then I do not need to communicate my emotions to them, or my feelings to them, or my thoughts to them, and they should understand me on the spot. I don't need to say it. No. Understand that you need to communicate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the beginning to the end of the Holy Quran, stresses on the notion of dialogue. Have dialogue, not monologue. Have dialogue with one another. Understand the more you do and the more you communicate with one another, is that the more you'll understand one another. And again, you, both of you, communicate with each other. Right? So have that sense of privacy where you can sit down and just speak, have a conversation, do activities together. Yeah? So communication is absolutely important in this regard. You will find that these are, the, these are some of the factors that strengthen a relationship and make it more stable. Because it's one thing to be married, and it's one thing to have a traditional routine. But still, you have to understand that that's not going to be the case all the time. It's not fighting, bickering, arguing. as a part of marriage. That's normal. It's going to happen, no doubt. But it's just the way how you deal with it. The more you communicate with one another, the better it is. And the more you will trust in each other. And trust is the main exact is the main pillar that keeps a proper marital life in fact and from that trust you will find that sayyida zainab sallallahu alaihi was entrusted with a trust that she had to deliver, deliver on the land of karbala no doubt the narrations say that when imam hussein sallallahu alaihi wasallam was Allah was left all by himself on the land of karbala with no companions, all his family members were martyred. He went back to the camp to say his last farewells to his family. Imam Hussein alayhi salam stood in the middle of the camp and said, who will present me my horse? And I am the son of Rasulullah. Who will present me my horse? And I am the son of Amirul Mu'mineen. Who shall present me my horse? And I am the son of Fatima, Sayyidatu Nisa al Alameen. The narration say that Sayyida Zainab alayha salam came outside the tent holding the horse of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, approaching him, telling him, Oh, my brother Hussein, how hard is my heart? Have you ever seen a sister presenting the horse of death to her own brother? Imam Hussein alayhi salam did dua for Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam. He rode his horse and he approached the battlefield. And then all of a sudden, Imam Hussein alayhi salam heard a voice from the back. Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam Shouted, uh, saying, Oh, my brother Hussein, uh, can you please come back? Uh, Imam Hussein alayhi salam returned back. Uh, she said, Oh, my brother Hussein, can you please come down from your horse? Uh, he said, What is the issue, Sayyid? My, my sister Zainab. She said, 
my brother just come down from your horse. Uh, Imam Hussein came down uh, and then she looked at him. She said, my brother Hussein, uh, I want you to unbutton your shirt for me. Um, Imam Hussein unbuttoned his shirt for his sister Zainab. Uh, Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam kissed Imam Hussein on his chest and on his neck. Uh, he said, uh, oh my sister Zainab, why did you do so? Uh, Sayyida Zainab replied saying, note my brother Hussein, uh, that when my mother Fatima was on her deathbed, uh, she called me and she said, uh, oh my daughter Zainab, um, a time will come where your brother Hussein will be alone on the land of Karbala with no one to support him and then he will ask for his horse know that my daughter Zainab when you present him his horse and you see him approaching the battlefield call him back and kiss him on his chest for this is where the horses will trample his chest and then kiss him on his neck uh, for this is where the sword uh, will, will sever his head from uh, and then tell him this is a trust uh, that I have been entrusted with from my mother Fatima when Sayyida Zainab salam finished she turned around uh, facing Medina uh, saying oh my mother Fatima the trust has been returned back to you uh, إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين